Welcome to our Wednesday evening online service. I pray that everybody is doing well. Um, let me just start off by saying that I miss everyone. Um, you know, sometimes you don't appreciate what you have until you lose it, but I'm thankful that we're going to get it back, that uh, God is on our side. So just be patient and um, keep doing, doing the things that you know to do. And uh, you've been taught well at the church. You, you have the faith. You have the, the ability to pray and to reach out to God. And remember, as I always say, to renew your minds with the word of God so you don't worry. But don't get in fear. I'm always here for you. If you need any assistance, if you need any prayer, you come to me and I'll help you. And, and uh, we'll get through this. And uh, I really believe that our um, breakthrough is, is coming just around the corner. But I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to feed you the uh, fresh manna that God has put in my heart. And uh, I've said this often that the Lord has really put it in my heart that during this time that the church stay together. And not just our church, but I know a lot of churches are, are doing a similar format. We're not the only church that hears from God. There's plenty of great churches in this communi community and in this country. And so we're hearing from God correctly. But the local church... Our love and our unity and our faith and our desire to be a, a bright light for God in this community and the way we take care of each other, the way we lift each other up, it's, it's, it's very, very important. We can't grow spiritually without those things in place. So thank you for being a part of the church. Thank you for not uh, um, getting sidetracked as far as that goes. I wanted to just continue to remind you that the church is open weekdays from 7 to 5, and you can come in and um, uh, return your offerings if you'd like to, or pray. And then Saturday and Sunday, the church is open from 9 to 5 for, for the same reasons. Um, other ways to give, you can give by mail. You can mail it in to 4042 Sycamore Grove Road, Chambersburg, PA, or by our PayPal account, which is Freedom in Christ Church at yahoo.com. And uh, once again, it has is, it is, uh, touched my heart. The people of the church are generous. They are giving. Uh, and you, it, it does me a lot of good because I'm not taking the pressure of this church on me. This, this church belongs to God. And Jesus said, my sheep will know my voice. And so you have heard his voice. You have taken care of this house and, and uh, you've blessed us. So thank you. We are fully supplied. We don't lack in anything. And so um, thank you for that. I do want to uh, encourage you with some scriptures when it comes to giving. Um, Jesus said in Luke 6, 38, Give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more. Running over, poured into your lap. The amount that you give will be determined by the amount that you get back. And so seed time and harvest always exist. We have seed time and harvest in the earth, and we have seed time and harvest in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said it, it's in both places. When you give into the church, you are giving into the kingdom of God. This is his, his kingdom on the earth. And God's kingdom is unlimited. So keep giving, keep trusting the Lord, and don't let fear stop you. Malachi 3.10, um, I will be saying this scripture completely through because this is the scripture that we are to stand on as far as tithe payers. And, and Malachi 3.10, it says, Bring all the tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Now, where's the storehouse? The storehouse is the local church. It's the place where you are getting fed. And so bring the tithe into the storehouse and try me now in this. When I, when I see the Lord say, try me, to me, he's saying, prove me. Go ahead and step out in faith. Get out of the fear. Go ahead and honor me with the tithes and prove me. See if I will not do what I say I will do. Because he says, try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. So did you know that heaven has windows? And how do you open the windows? By giving of your tithe. And then in verse 11, it just gets better. He says, I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. 
and all the nations will call you blessed, for you shall be a delightsome land, says the Lord of hosts. And so I want to encourage you with that. Um, one, one other scripture the Lord gave me is Galatians 6, 9. It says, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Don't get weary. Keep doing what the word of God says. When I start to worry, when I start to fear, when, when the pressures of life uh, come at me, what I do is I, al I always go back to the word, but not just go back to what I know in my mind. I go back to what I believe in my heart. I go back to the word that I acted on. When I know that I've acted on the word and I've trusted God, then it brings me peace because I know that God's, God cannot lie. Did you know that? God can't lie. He, he, he always tells the truth. And so I wanted to encourage you in that way. Um, let me take a minute and pray over these offerings. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, and I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to give. I thank you, Lord, that we give with a glad heart, and we give on purpose, Lord. There will be nothing, Lord God, that will separate us from the love of God that came to us through Christ Jesus. And one of the ways that we show our faith and our appreciation is through our giving. And I thank you, Lord, for the harvest from our giving. Thank you, Lord, for opening the windows of heaven. And thank you for rebuking the devourer for our sake. For the church's sake, Lord, and for all these people in this church, Lord, the body of Christ here. Thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now for our message. This message has been um, in my heart. And it's called, God, I'm Sorry. How many know that as believers, when we make mistakes and struggle in life, it's important that we know how to deal with our shortcomings. We need to know how to say, God, I'm sorry. When I was a, um, a young kid, I, I got saved pretty early, and uh, my parents weren't saved. And so I hadn't gotten any teaching. I'm thankful that they did get saved later and, and taught me very, very well, but I was sort of in no man's land. I got saved at a vacation Bible school or an um, after-school program uh, of, of Bible release. Or, and uh, um, so I knew the Lord, but I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to grow up spiritually. And I remember one day I had done something that wasn't very good. I don't even remember what it was, but I rem remember thinking in my heart, I bet you God's not pleased with me. I bet you that that um, um, it just wasn't a good thing for me to do. And, and it started to bother me. What I started to feel was guilt. You see, for the first time in my life, I had a God conscience. Before I met the Lord, I knew right from wrong, and I'd have a conscience about that. But now, I had a God conscience. Now, it was weighing on me. What must God think of me? Did I disappoint him? And, and what am I going to do about it? I had no idea what to do about it. So what I did was I imposed a, a punishment on myself, a self-imposed punishment and um, it, in two different ways. The first thing I did is I wouldn't allow myself to listen to the uh, Baltimore Orioles on the radio. Back then I had a little portable radio. I carried it with me everywhere. This is back in the late 70s mid to late 70s, and I used to love to listen to the Orioles, and um, they were my team. WCHA, Chuck Thompson would be the broadcaster, uh, Paul Blair, Brooks Robinson, Mark Belanger, Jim Palmer, they, they, they were my guys, and uh, I would listen to that, uh, that, those games, and, and uh, this, of course, was before ESPN and all those sports channels that we have today, and uh, I really loved to do it, but I wouldn't allow myself that evening to listen to the game. I wanted to punish myself. And then the other punishment that I had was I had a brand new bicycle that my parents bought me. It was a fast bike. I loved to, to um, ride it. I didn't allow myself to ride my bike that evening. I would, uh, what I did was walk it around in circles. Just, just, I don't know how long I did it, but I just walked it around in circles. You see, I was paying the price for my sin because I had no other way of, of dealing with that guilt. And I, and I felt that I needed to um, uh, 
make amends to God. And so, boy, am I glad I'm past that. But you know what rings true in my heart and what motivates me in my heart as a pastor? There are hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Christians out there. They are still where I was as a child because they never grew up spiritually. They never heard the truth of God's love. They don't know what to do when they miss it. They don't know how to say, God, I'm sorry. But today, you are going to learn how to say, God, I'm sorry. And, uh, and let me just say this. I hope I don't burst anybody's faith bubble. But it's not a matter of if you make a mistake. It's a matter of when. Because we're all human. And so, um, but we're going to learn uh, exactly what to do. We're going to build a case in the Word of God for how to say, God, I'm sorry. I'm going to use a lot of scriptures and we're just going to go line upon line, precept upon precept, and I want this to get into you. So just relax, settle in, and just sort of block out a little bit of time here and let the Word of God minister to you. Let your pastor minister into your heart. And uh, this, is, this is how I, I get my spiritual food. This is how I get my satisfaction by teaching you and, and, and letting you know what I know and what God has put in my heart. That's why I said we need the fresh manna. And we need, we need to keep growing spiritually. If you don't understand this concept that I'm going to give you, you will not grow spiritually. You will, you will be stuck. I didn't say you wouldn't be a child of God, but how many know that we need to grow up spiritually? We need to learn and, and learn about our Father, learn, learn the ways of, of the Word of God, and, and then follow those ways. And so as believers... When we struggle, we must understand that our shortcomings do not change our relationship with God or our position in Christ. We are still his children, and we are still in Christ under the blood of Jesus Christ. If you don't understand that, you're going you're gonna to have a miserable life, a miserable in that, a life. And that wouldn't be fair because God wants you to have life and have it more abundantly. But just because you make a mistake, just because you fail, just because you get angry, just because you do something that you know you shouldn't do, it doesn't change the fact that if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are a child of the living God. You belong to God. You're in the family already, and your life is hid in Christ. He paid for you. You are the body of Christ. And so get this down into your spirit right now. When you make mistakes and when you struggle and when you do all kinds of things that you wish you wouldn't do, Understand that you don't lose your position in Christ and you don't lose your place in the family of God. There's been many times in my life that my dad and I, when I was younger, you know the teenage years when you think you know it all. And uh, um, my dad and I butted heads and, and um, we didn't get along. But at no time did he ever say, you're not my son anymore. At no time did I ever say, you're not my dad anymore because we knew that we loved each other. And so God doesn't throw you away just because you have struggles in your life, just like you wouldn't throw your children away. I know a lot of religious places do throw people away. They, they put these burdens on them that no one could ever live up to. They don't live up to them themselves. And, and they look at the outward appearance and they see people struggling with, with certain things that they, that they are doing. But Jesus said the biggest thing issues, the, the biggest um, sinful things are the things that come out of the heart, <laughs> the things that come out of the mouth or, or come out from, up from within the person, like strife and discord and quarreling and, and being judgmental and, and not showing love. They are, are far more worse than what somebody could possibly get into in the other areas. But here's some scripture. Because remember, I said we're going to build our case on the, on the Word of God. These scriptures are to verify to us that we do not lose our position in Christ or our relationship with God. In John 3.3, 3, Jesus said we are born again in the Spirit by believing. When you become born again, it's in your spirit that you become a brand new person. Your spirit was created in the image of God. God is an eternal spirit being, and so are you. You will live forever. The Christians will live forever in heaven or with God. The non-believers will live in hell, which is a terrible place. But, but they don't, you don't die. You're an eternal spirit. 
That part of you has gotten born again. And Jesus said you'll have everlasting life. You won't perish. And, and a confirmation scripture is 2 Corinthians 5.17 says that you are a new creation. Where? In the spirit. If I'm 5 foot 10, 200 pounds, when, uh, before I get saved, I will be 5 foot 10, 200 pounds after I get saved. You're not a new creation in your body, and you're definitely not a new creation in your mind. That part of you, your mind, your will, and your emotions, the way you think, that natural part of you, that needs to be renewed every day with the Word of God. So where are you new? What, what, where's the born again? In your spirit. You're born again spirit. You're a new creation. You see, God seals you with the Holy Spirit. He's not turning his back on you. You are a child of God. And that's important that you know that because you've got to have confidence like that because if you don't have that kind of confidence, you're going you're gonna to get discouraged. How many know that Satan is the master discourager? He's the one that tempts you to do wrong, and then when you do wrong, he's the one that points the finger at you. Don't get in those games. 1 Corinthians 1.17 says that, that you are the one who is united and joined to the Lord is one spirit with the Lord. You are one spirit with the Lord. That doesn't change. And Romans 8, 17 says we are children of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We are right now children of God. Right now, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Now let's grow up spiritually. Let's lay aside those things that have hurt us and those things that weigh us down. And, and, and let's move into the spiritual things of God and, and just, just glorify God with our lives. Let's give him all the glory because he deserves it. You know, the Apostle Paul, he dealt with the church at Corinth um, a lot. The church at Corinth came out of a lot of um, bad things. And it took them a while to finally get the, the, the whole picture of how they are to be. But Paul was patient with them. And uh, in Corinthians... He says this, he comes, he comes into the church, I think it's for 1 Corinthians 3, 3. And he was disappointed in the church at Corinth. He said there's quarreling and there's division and there's, there's strife in here. And, and, and what they were doing, they were comparing Paul with Apollos. They were comparing two different ministers and Paul said, you're carnal. He said, you're acting like mere human beings that have never met the Lord. You're acting like someone who does not have the Spirit of God in them. He didn't say they weren't children of God. At no time did he take their citizenship card from them. He was saying, you're acting like, like the world does, people that, that don't know God. And, and he said this, he said that I should be feeding you with the milk, I should be feeding you with the meat of God's Word, but you still need the milk of the Word and he said this, he said, You're, are you not all carnal? Are you not all still operating in the flesh? And so I said that to tell you that if you read in the Corinthians, you won't find a church that struggled any more than they did. That's the very same church that went to communion and got drunk. The very same church. Half the people over here were wealthy. They got drunk and they were, they were eating till they were full and, and, and couldn't eat anymore. Then the other part of the church over here had no money, no nothing, and they're poor. It was a terrible mess. At no time, you check the church of Corinth, at no time did Paul say, you're not believers. At no time did he say, you're not children of God anymore. He, what was he trying to do? Grow them up spiritually. He was trying to keep, to keep renewing their mind and feeding them on the truth of God's word so that they could, they could come out of that stuff and glorify God with their life. And so that's important to understand. In Ephesians 2, 8, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And so the root of your salvation, the cause, is your faith in Jesus Christ. It was a gift from God to you. You can't earn it. If you could earn it, then, then why did Jesus have to die? And so when you heard the word, you believed in Jesus Christ, and, and you made that decision that he would be your Lord and Savior, that is the root of your salvation. That's the cause. It's the gift. Now, the works come after you get the gift in the root, or, or the fruit 
comes from the root. The fruit is the life that you live for God. What are you going to do with the Spirit of God in you now? What are you going to do with this born-again spirit? What are you going to do with this word of God, this word of wisdom? What are you going to do with all of these, this awesome field of grace set before you? What are you going to do with that? That's the fruit. That's, that's how we glorify God. And you could never do any of these things that, without the power of God anyway. You, couldn't, you can't live for God without the power of God. But with the power of God, you can do anything. And so Hebrews 4, 14 through 16, tells us exactly what we are to do when we miss it. It tells us exactly our, the, the attitude that we're to have. It tells us our heart condition. It says this in Hebrews 4, 14. He says, seeing then that we have a great high priest, that would be Jesus, who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. See, Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father. He's representing us to the Father. Our lives are hid in Him. He represents, we are one spirit with Him. We are uh, the body of Christ. So you have to remember that. In verse 15, it says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Jesus is touched He's moved by our weaknesses. In other words, he cares. Not only does he care, not only does he understand, he does all these things because he knows what it's like to be human. He went through a lot of the temptations that we will go through. He became a human being, and so he is qualified to be our high priest. And, and the Bible tells us right here, it tells us that that. Because Jesus cares, we are to come to the throne of grace. But the infirmities, when it says that he is touched by the feeling of our infirmities, infirmities in the Greek, it refers to feebleness of, of your body or mind. Have you ever been, you born again believers, have you ever felt feeble in your mind? Have you ever felt feeble in your body? Have you ever thought, oh, geez, I just lost my temper today and I thought I was past all that. Oh, geez, I just yelled at my wife and kicked the cat and, and, and knocked the dog out or something. You know, whatever, I acted, I acted so bad. Well, that's because you're human. Now, don't, don't abuse any cats or anything. But the infirmities refer, refers to feebleness of body or mind. Listen to this, moral frailty. Frailty in our morality, disease, sickness, weakness, or failures. All of those categories, Jesus is touched by our weakness. I don't see any room for, for running the other way. Not as long as we have Jesus on our side. Think about it. If Jesus died for you, do you think he's going to give up on you just because you've made mistakes and you failed and you know one of the greatest people in the new testament is the apostle paul apostle the apostle paul through the holy spirit wrote two-thirds of the of the new testament and you know what he said he said the things that i want to do i don't do and the things that i that uh, i don't want to do i do he, he, he's, he's comparing himself that I have the spirit of God in me. I have this will to do right, but I don't always get there. And sometimes I do things that I know I shouldn't do. Paul had that problem. But Paul, he, he said, what can save me from this death trap that I'm in? And he says, he says this, he says, but the law, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. See, you're not under the law of sin and death. You're not separated from God by your sins anymore. Jesus paid the price. You're children of God. So Paul said there is a new, there's a new law at work here, and it's the law of the spirit of life. The spirit of God has made me alive to the Father. That law keeps me going. That law keeps me coming to, to God's throne. And see, you have to understand that. In verse 16 of Hebrews 4, having said all that, he says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. 
that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. See, the throne of grace is a place of acceptance. It's a place of acceptance. If, it was, if, it, if you had to deserve to go to the throne of grace, it wouldn't be a throne of grace anymore. It would be a throne of works or a throne of me deserving something. It is a throne of grace. You didn't deserve it. I don't deserve it. We didn't even deserve to be saved, but God loved us anyway, and he sent Jesus. So, so we're going to go with him, right? So we're thankful for that. But he said, come boldly. You know what that means to come boldly? It means to come confidently. Come with confidence that you know that your Father loves you. Come confident when you pray and you go to the Father, when you struggle in life, that you know that Jesus is representing you to the Father. Come with the confidence that you know that Jesus cares. He's touched with your feelings of your infirmities. I know that some of you might have ran across a religious person who was critical and looked, looked down on you and, and, and shook their head every time you did something wrong. But God isn't like that. I want to, I'll give you some advice. The Lord put this in my spirit one day when I was preaching. Stay out of the head-shaking circles. You know what a head-shaking circle is? You got a group of people, they're in a circle, and everybody is talking about someone. Something that they did, some bad thing about them, or, and, and everybody's talking about this person, and everybody's shaking their head like, mm-mm-mm. Stay out of the head-shaking circles. You know, you want to be in the head-lifting circle. Don't get in there and jump in on anybody. You know, encourage them. And I pray this message helps you. I pray that this message gives you strength and gives you courage. And you say, you know what? I'm tired of running from God. Why run from God when he's the one who, 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 who sent his son to die for you? He knows it all anyway. All he's waiting for you to do is exactly, all you need to do is do exactly what the word says. Just do what the word says. And it says, come boldly or with confidence to the throne of grace. When we go over to my parents' house, we'll have birthday parties over there from time to time. And um, I walk right in the door. I walk right in there and I go to the refrigerator and get out a Diet Coke. And, and why do I do that? Well, that's my family. And, and I, I feel um, it's a place of acceptance to me. And I'm not going to be turned away. No one's going to smack my hand for getting a, a Diet Coke. You need to come to God that way. Once again, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that you may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Mercy and grace in what? Your time of need. You see, what this message is, it's a pastor's message. This is, this is what's in my heart continually. I want to raise people up spiritually. I want them to know who they are in Christ. I don't want them to give up on what God's done in their life. I know what it's like to, to fail. I fail every day in one way or another. But I don't make it be about my failures and my weakness. I make it be about a God who loves me. I make it be about my Lord and Savior who is sitting at the right hand of the Father waiting for me to come to the Father through Him. It's not about who I am anymore on my own. It, it's who am I in Christ. In Christ, I am a child of God. In Christ, I am one spirit with the Lord. In Christ, I am a joint heir with Jesus Christ. In Christ, I am born again. In Christ, I have eternal life. And so therefore, I will not run from God. I will run to God no matter what's going on in my life, no matter what's happening. That's a good word for us. Now, Ephesians 2, 10, it says, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Let me say it again. We are all God's workmanship. He's working on every one of us. We were created in Christ Jesus for good works. God prepared these works beforehand that we should walk in these works. God's got it all set up. Why would God have you be his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, and prepare a good work for you if you were unable to do it? You can do it, but you have to remember this. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. You have to use all the tools that God gave you. 
There's a lot of Christians, they have good, good, solid hearts. They love God, but they're too hard on themselves. They, they, they just feel um, just bad because they're not able to reach a certain level that they think they should be at. What, what happens when, what are you supposed to do when you feel like that? Well, go ahead and get it all worked out at the throne of grace, right? Go ahead and pray to, pray to God. You're his workmanship. He's not giving up on you, but they struggle. I, I want to tell you something. There is a difference between condemnation and conviction. Condemnation is when someone is outside of God, outside of the family of God, and they are lost in sin. And if they don't get it right, they will be condemned with the world. And, and they're separated from God. But as a believer, we're not in condemnation. We've, all, we've already been brought into the family of God. Now it's about conviction. Now it's about keeping your heart soft and keeping it tender and keeping it ready to hear from the Lord and, and, and want, wanting to live a pleasing life to God. It's about getting better every day at what we do. But it's not, take, it's not taking on condemnation. Nothing's going to separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Now the name of our church is Freedom in Christ Church. God gave that name to my mother back in 1978. And sometimes when religious people hear our name, they, they, they get the wrong idea. Because it says freedom in Christ. And I know exactly what they're thinking. I can read their little religious minds. And, and a lot of times they're, they're thinking that we're saying we are free to sin. No, get out of here with that. I don't want to sin. I don't want to do the things of the world. What that name means, we are free free from sin and free to get into God's presence. Freedom in Christ means we are free from sin, not that we go out there and do ho live however we want to, to live, but we, un we understand that if you don't get that, that condemnation of sin off of you, and if you don't know who you are in Christ, if you don't know about the throne of grace, that throne of acceptance, if you don't realize that nothing you could ever do as a born-again believer can ever change your position in Christ and, and, and who you are as a child of God, if you don't know that, you're going you're gonna to be way somewhere out there and, and you will have no peace. You, you won't have any peace. And so remember, we're God's workmanship. And so we are to live our lives looking for the return of our Lord and Savior. Every day, we should live our lives as if, as if the Lord could come back today. And we are to live our lives as if he... And on the other hand, we're to work as if, as if we have a whole lifetime to work. There's a balance there. But it is important to know that Jesus is coming back. He's coming back for the church, and we are to look for his appearing. The Bible is very clear on that. The Bible says when Jesus re returns, we shall be like him. We will see him for, for who he is. There will be no flesh in the way, no flesh barrier. We will see Jesus face to face. And you know what? We will be like him. As I said, and the Bible says, everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. They'll live a good life. They'll stay away from evil. They'll live lives pleasing to God. Think about it. If you knew that you knew that you knew that, that Jesus was coming back tonight at 8 o'clock, what would happen between now and 8 o'clock? Well, you might be the world's greatest evangelist by then. You might just throw out everything in your life that, that doesn't um, glorify God. I mean, I'm sure there would be a change in you, right? And so when we look for the Lord to come and we're expecting him to come, it, it's how we purify ourselves. It's how we, we keep ourselves from getting trapped in the world and keep ourselves from going, going the world's way. And, and, and we live good, good lives for God. There was a, a man one day, he said, he said, you know, my grandmother said for years that Jesus was coming back. She used to say that all, all the time when I was a kid. And, and she's been gone for years now, and, and he never came back. Jesus never came back. And, and uh, he said that sort of like uh, um, just uh, sort of making fun. And you know what? Jesus said in the last days there will be scoffers. There will be people that say, when's he coming back? 
They've been saying for years that he's coming back. Did he fall asleep? I wouldn't want to be in the land of the scoffer. I'd want to be in the land of the believer. And so you know what I think about his grandmother? He misjudged her life. Misjudged her life. She lived exactly how she was supposed to live. Think about it. Every day of her life when she woke up in the morning, she said, Lord, this could be the day that you come back and I'm going to live for you. I'm going to do what's pleasing in your life. She lived a good, wholesome, clean life before the Lord and now she'll get her reward. I wonder what her grandson thought that she missed out on. What did she miss out on living a life like that? What did she miss out on? Being in the world? Getting caught up in that? No, no, no. If you live in the world, you will be stolen from. Satan will steal, kill, and destroy you out there, and you'll lose your reward in the end if you don't give God the glory, if you don't use the power of God to bring glory into your lives. And I'll show you that. And so she didn't, she didn't miss out on anything. She did exactly what she's supposed to do. And that's what we're supposed to do. Wake up every morning. And say, Lord, I see the chaos going on out there in the world. I see what's going on. And, and Lord, I know that this could be the day that you're coming back. And I'm going to live for you. And I'm going to glorify you. And I'm going to come to the throne of grace. And I'm going to keep, keep doing what you put in my heart to do. Even if I get discouraged, I will not grow weary in doing good. Lord, because I know that you're coming back. And I know that when you come back, I will be just like you. You, you, will, you will be... Uh, my Lord and Savior forever. And that's the heart of gratitude, isn't it? Now, non-believers, when their time on earth is done, they will go to the great white throne judgment. Let me tell you something about the great white throne judgment for non-believers. It's a terrible place. Terrible place. When it's all said and done, everyone who has rejected Jesus Christ will go to that great great white throne. The Bible says there'll be both great and small people from all different walks of life, all different nationalities, all different races. All these people will stand before a holy God at this great white throne judgment, and they're going to have to give an account for the life that they've lived. In other words, they're going to have to um, convince a holy God and be good enough on their own to go into the presence of God for eternity based on their righteousness. Bad news, the Bible clearly tells us that our righteousness is as filthy rags. The Bible clearly says that Jesus Christ was the only one who could take away sins, and they rejected the, the gift. They rejected the way into eternal life. So they're going to stand there, and they're going to have to give this account, and none of them are going to make it. There are going to be billions and billions of people there, and they will get thrown into the lake of fire, which is called Gehenna. Sometimes churches don't like to speak on hell. Well, I say, why not? Jesus taught on hell a lot. You know why Jesus taught on hell? He didn't want anybody to go there. Would you want someone to go there? If, you, if you've seen that terrible place, hell is, is, there's no second chances. Once you're there, you're there. It's this life that we must determine where we will spend eternity. And how you make that determination is Jesus Christ. He's at the center of it all. He has always been at the center of it all. And so we, the believer, we have accepted him into our life. We're, we have humbled ourselves. We know, and we've come to the place where we know we need a Lord and Savior, and we've asked him to come in, and we were changed. We were born again in the Spirit. doesn't mean that we're perfect, but it means that we, we, we humbled ourselves, <laughs> and we reverenced God, and, and, and we said, God, uh, I believe every word that you say about your son. He is the only way. Jesus Christ is the only way to eternal life. No other religion will get you there. No other religion can get you there because those other religions don't have Jesus. We have Jesus. He is God's Son. He is the only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. He is the one who knew no sin, who became sin so that we could be the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He is the one that the Father has sent all those people at the great white throne judgment. You know, sometimes people say this. They say, well, I don't know why a loving God would throw all those people into hell. See, you're, you're looking at it wrong. First of all, when you talk about the love of God, what you're supposed to, to, to look at is the cross. 
God's love for humanity, for the whole world, was demonstrated to us through the cross. Jesus died a death that he did not have to die. He never sinned. That was God hanging on that cross. God the Son, God Jesus, died for you so that you would not have to go to hell. That's love. We have to get out of this shallowness. And we have to understand, why do you think you see crosses all over the place? God wants you to see the cross because it's, it's a symbol of his love and his mercy for you. Why do you think the governments all over the world are taking crosses down and getting rid of crosses? Because there's power at the cross. So the loving God that you're talking about, he has already done something. Anything that God has done for us in the New Testament is called grace. God did something for us that we did not deserve on our own. That's grace. How we respond to that grace is called faith. How are you going to respond to it? You're hearing me right now. Some of you are hearing me right now. How are you going to respond to it? If I asked you if you would die today, why would God let you into heaven? What would your answer be? Would your answer be, well, I tried to never hurt anybody. Would your answer be that I went to church for my whole life and did the best I could do? Would your answer be as to why God will let you into heaven? Well, my parents, when I was younger, they, they, they christened me. Uh, all those answers are not good. All those answers are what the people at the great white throne judgment will have. Here's your answer. And you have a chance today. Here's your answer. Why would God let you into heaven? Here's your answer. I heard the word one day. And the word of God came into me. And I believed it. And, and I know that Jesus is my Lord and Savior. I've accepted that sacrifice. He took my sins away. And now I'm a child of God. I'm born again. And I know when my time on earth is done, I'm going to a place called heaven. Nothing will ever change that. That's the only answer. See, all the other answers are works. People trying to work their way, work their way, work their way, trying to be good enough. You could never in a million years be good enough to go into heaven. You need to accept the sacrifice. You need to accept Jesus. And, and to get out, of that, get out of that religious thing. I said it the other day. Many people need to get delivered out of religion. Just like they got delivered out of the world, some people. Get delivered out of that religion. You'll not go to heaven because you belong to a certain church. You'll not go to heaven because if you're a Catholic, because you pray to Mary. What, where, where does the Bible ever say to pray to Mary? I'm not getting in any kind of conflict, but I'm just telling you the truth. Mary didn't die for you. Jesus did. Mary was a blessed person. She was the mother of God, and she's in heaven right now. But, but, but she's there the same way as you. She believed in her son, Jesus. She believed in the sacrifice, Right? And so we don't want to go to the great white throne judgment. We want to go where there's another judgment seat. And it's called the judgment seat of Christ. All believers are on that road. Listen to what it says about the judgment seat of Christ. In 2 Corinthians 5.10, it says, For we must all, who's the all? All believers. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether good or bad. We're all going to go to the judgment seat of Christ one day. The one who died for you and the one who lives for you, he is the one that we, we are to serve. You're not going to stand before me one day. I'll be right there with you. I'll be right there with you. I'm only accountable to do what God called me to do. And that's what I'm doing. I'm called to be the pastor of this church, and I'm doing it to the best of my ability, expecting the Holy Spirit to always make up the difference. And, and I, don't, I don't always get it right, and I, I'm just like anyone else, but I don't run from God. I go right to the throne of grace, and I live my life as if the Lord could come back tomorrow. And that's how I keep myself pure and living right before the Lord. I don't allow myself to get caught up into that stuff in the world because that stuff in the world will take you places you don't want to be. And so it's the judgment seat of Christ that we will end up at. 
Then the Bible says that our works will be tried by fire on the day of judgment. Listen to this. It's 1 Corinthians 3, 13 amplified. Each one's work will be clearly shown for what it is. For the day of judgment will disclose it because it has to be revealed with fire. And the fire will test the quality and character and worth of each person's work. If any person's work which he has built on this foundation, that is any outcome of his effort, if it remains and survives the test, he will receive a reward. But if any person's work is burned up by that test, he will suffer the loss of his reward. Yet he himself will be saved, but only as one who has barely escaped through the fire. That says a lot to me. Jesus is the foundation that we build our life on. What is the foundation of Jesus? We have the gift of salvation from God by believing in Jesus Christ. In him we live and move and have our being. And out of that foundation comes the fruit or the works. And now our motives for doing what we do and why we do will be tested by fire. There are some people, they have really good ministries. They do a lot for the Lord. But you know what? What will determine if it is, if it is legit will be the fire. There are some people... They do a lot of, like I said, they do a lot of good things, but their heart's not right with the Lord. This has always been about getting your heart right with the Lord. That's all it's always been about. One day I was, uh, I went to hear a preacher, and man, he, he was hard. And he was just hard on the believers. And he just, just, I didn't feel good listening to him. And I know you need those types of messages. Don't, and, and this this message should make this clear to you. We need to, to, be in a, in a repentant state to come back to God and, and, to, and to give him our heart because um, not, it's not what God will do to us, but it's what the world will do. You have to have a good and right heart to be able to believe God for anything or your own heart will convict you. And he, he gave this message that was so hard. And I'll just tell you, it was a different message than what that I grew up under and what I preach. And, and uh, I was praying one day and the Lord helped me because I want to make sure I'm preaching the right message. I want to make sure I'm telling people the truth. And, and, and he shook me a little bit with that. And uh, the Lord said this. He said, well, it's all, it's, 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 it's a matter of when you're dealing with people. Are they coming to me or are they going from me? He meant in their heart. In their heart, are they pushing towards me? Are they striving to, to get to know me? Are they are they?" staying humble and coming my way, or are they rebelling and running away? And, and, and um, it doesn't, doesn't have anything to do with God's love, but it has to do with what kind of heart condition are they in. Now, <clears throat> I've seen people over all these many years, I'm just telling you right now, I just like to keep a balance. I've seen people who, who they did not look like much, they did not smell like much. They did not, I mean, they, um, by that I mean you could smell all kinds of things on them that they shouldn't have been doing. And, and they looked like um, not much. But their heart was gold. Why was it gold? They were coming to God. They weren't running from God. They were spending time in God's presence saying, God, I want to get to know you. God, I want to serve you. God, I want to please you. And God honored their heart. It's their heart. It's not the way they look on the outside. It's not even really what they do or they don't do. We all want to glorify God, but, but you can't look at the outside like that. Because on the flip side of that coin, I've seen people that go to church for years. I've seen people that know the word of God like the back of their hand. And they've gotten rid of all the stuff in life that used to keep them down. And, they, and, and I mean, they don't do any of those things anymore. They don't drink. They don't smoke. They don't do no drugs. They don't go out and do any kind of wild living. I mean, they're, they're straight. But I've seen people like that, that their heart was messed up. 
they're the ones that a lot of times start the quarrels and the divisions and the arguments. They're the ones sometimes that look down and, and break the spirit of unity. You know what the Bible says? You know how to keep a good heart in your church? The Bible says we are to edify each other in love. Lift people up. Don't look for a position. Don't look for a title. Don't even look for acceptance. Just live for God. Live as if he's coming back today. When I first started preaching, I had a lot to overcome. Tremendous amount. I, I, I admit, my biggest attribute is my heart. I don't have the whole, a whole lot of talent, a lot, a lot of other gifts the other ways, but I do have a good heart, and I do have the call of God on my life, and I've guarded that. And God's been with me every step of the way. And one day I was preaching um, when I first got here, and um, I was looking out over the congregation. And uh, it's amazing when, when I'm preaching sometimes, it's like everything's in slow motion. So I try not to lock on people's eyes or anything, but I just like just... It's just different under that anointing. And uh, so while I'm preaching, I'm having this conversation with the Lord. And I said, Lord, I don't think that half of the people in here are listening to me. I see some heads nodding over there. I see some people on their cell phones over there. Uh, I see some, right at the most important point of the whole message, someone gets up and goes to the bathroom. Try that once. And then everybody in the, in the congregation, they're like, they follow that person. <laughs> and you're just trying to lay the mega point out. And it's like, oh. And if you're not careful, you can take that burden on yourself. And, and I said, Lord, I think about half of the people are listening to me. I'm saying this to him while I'm preaching. And he said, that's okay. Preach to the half that are listening. And that really helped me. Because you know what? Jesus said, my sheep will know my voice. They'll know his voice. And, and so you, you can't worry about pleasing people or living for people or, or don't worry about any kind of discouragement. Live for Jesus Christ. And in living for Jesus Christ, now you will humble yourself to people that God puts in your life. If you're trying to be a part of a church and you don't humble yourself in that place, your heart's going to be messed up. You're not going to have the right kind of heart to believe God for anything you won't be able to believe your way out of a wet paper bag, I'm telling you. Because that's why the Bible says in Proverbs, guard your heart, for out of it flows the issues of life. You've got to keep your heart right. You've got to talk to yourself. You've got to be disciplined in there. And when you miss it, when you miss it, what are you going to do when your heart's not right? You're going to go to God. You're going to go to the throne of grace with that nice, tender, soft heart. And you're going to say, God, I made a mistake. God, I wish I wouldn't have said that. And God, I'm going to make it right. God, I know what, what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to live for you, not myself. When I went to Ramah, um, the Lord wanted me to be an usher. And uh, I did not want to be an usher. When I first got to Ramah, my mom was with me, and we were sitting down in the nice, comfortable seats, and I saw those ushers, and I said, Mom, see those ushers? I'll never be one of them. Ha, ha, ha. I don't feel the need to be seen in front of people and be in front of people like that. And, and uh, boy, was I wrong. Don't ever say never, <laughs> right? And, and, uh, but it was a challenge, but it was the most rewarding part of Rhema. I, I ushered for two years, and I worked with the children for two years. So I put my dues in. I planted my seed, and I honored that place. I honored Pastor Hagen and Brother Hagen, and I did the right things. Even though I could have been doing anything else, I, I honored them. You know, they're working with those children. It's not like, you know, maybe an hour or, or two. It's like four hours. You got to get there early and, and, and uh, stay there late. And why serve God if you're not going to put your heart into it? I mean, if you're going to do it, do it right. And, and, and uh, because you're going to get a reward. God never forgets any act of love you do for him or his church. And one day, um, we were told to pick up all the offering envelopes in the whole sanctuary and put out new offerings envelopes. They were having a uh, winter Bible seminar or something. And so... Um, 
that was a little hard on me after the service because I needed to go pick my children up at the children's class, and, and I was a single parent. And so I, was, I felt the stress. I felt the pressure. And uh, so I'm trying to work as best as I can. There's four or five other ushers doing it. That's a lot of seats. I think there's like 4,800 seats in there. And uh, there was one usher. He wasn't even a head usher or anything. He'd just been there a million years. So I guess he had the right to stand there and watch us. And he was standing there like this, just looking at us. And uh, I was getting madder and madder by the minute. Because where I come from, everybody works. Everybody pitches in. You don't stand there. But anyway, so we got all these envelopes gathered up. And I thought, oh, we're done. And, and uh, now I can go get the kids because they don't like it when they're the last ones picked up at the class. And, uh, um, and so right when I was about ready to go back to the usher's room, this, this usher that was standing there, he said, hey, John. You missed a section. And he was right. There's one little section over there that nobody got. He said, you missed a section. And I said, oh, yeah. Okay. Why don't you get it since you didn't do anything? I actually spoke to him like that. And that felt good for about five seconds, maybe a little longer. Felt good for a little bit. But then my heart started to convict me. And you know what? I'm glad my heart convicted me because God did not send me to Ramah to spout off to an usher. He did not send me to act like that. He sent me to be humble. He sent me to learn to serve. And it bothered me. And I said, God, I'm going to tell that man that I am so sorry for what I did the next time I seen him. And when I seen him, I apologized to him. And and he accepted my apology. We have to all do that. We have to all keep our hearts right. And I'll close with this. Jesus said in John 10, 10, that the, the thief is Satan. And he steals and he kills and he destroys. A lot of times we think about that he's stealing from us on the earth. He's stealing things and he is. But you know the biggest theft that Satan does, the biggest theft is he steals people, e- people's eternal reward. They'll suffer loss because they listen to the devil. They did things out of their own selfish motives. They, they, they did all these things so that they could be seen, so that they could be heard. Some people sing for God. Some people sing for themselves. Some people preach for God, and some people preach for themselves. I learned a long time ago, the Lord told me, he says, um, don't speak because you, because you want to say something. Speak because you have something to say, something that I tell you to say. But there's people all over the place. They're, they're, I mean, they're all different. God figures that out. My job is to shepherd you and to get you where you need to be. My, God is, my job is to tell you the truth. And Satan steals these eternal rewards that, that, that this, bio, this scripture just told us about. He, it says it's, they will suffer loss. That grandmother that I was telling you about, that look for the Lord to come every day and he didn't come in her lifetime, I guarantee you one thing, she's not suffering any loss. She's going to get her reward. And I've often said this in the church. All you're accountable to do is what God called you to do. That's all. No more, no less. One of the greatest ministers of all times was Billy Graham. Many people look at Billy Graham and they think, man, he's just a great minister. His rewards are going to be so tremendous when, 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 he, when, we, when he gets to heaven and when it's all said and done. You're looking at it wrong. Billy Graham will get no more reward than, say, a Sunday school teacher who taught faithfully for 30 years and did it because she loved God and loved the church and loved the people. She did what she was called to do, what she was supposed to do. Billy Graham did what he was supposed to do. And when you, when you put it all together, we don't do any of, these, any of these things in our own might anyway. We do it by the power of God. He gives us the gifts and the talents to do it. And so Billy Graham did what he was supposed to do. This Sunday school teacher did what she was supposed to do. And they'll get the same reward. The world looks at things a little bit different. Jesus said the way up in the kingdom of God is down by serving and giving and humbling. You know when he gave that lesson? When he was washing their feet. You want to be great in the kingdom of God? Serve. Don't worry about anything but serving and loving and respecting and, 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 and showing honor. Then your heart will be pliable. It'll be soft. And, and, 
God will be able to move you and shape you and, and mold you and get you to where you need to be. And then you'll speak to the storms and you'll speak to the mountains and the mountain will move. Well, God bless you. I pray that that has helped you and, and uh, um, keep me in your prayers and, and, and I'll keep you in my prayers. God bless you.